<laughs> okay, we're going to get started. So, uh, it's more than a pleasure for me to introduce Matt Wright again to those of you who were, have been around and we've had you here and you've spoken before. And today we're linking your presence with a concert this evening, which has become uh, kind of de rigueur for, for Sinmat, which is that we don't want to just talk about it, we want to do it, and uh, our laboratory is a stage, and there's your laboratory. So everything you do and everything I talk about is very easy for me, because I know a lot about your history, and you have been a uh, more than anything, one of the great collaborators that I know through all time, and you have supported uh, Ed Campion's work on any number of major points that go all the way back to practice, to tempo curving, to karai, to uh, uh, there's at least one more big project. Me in Manka, we went to Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Art is filled. <laughs> Art is filled. <laughs> filled. <laughs> Patrick. And uh, we went on tour to Pittsburgh. <laughs> From Carnegie Hall to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania years ago with the orchestra. Uh -huh. And then don't forget our art wall business. Wait a minute. Art wall. <laughs> Where did that come in? Where was also in New York. Oh my gosh, that, that one I completely <laughs> blanked out. <laughs> yeah, the art wall that never was in a certain way. Yeah, and that was with Myers Sound. That was a huge project at uh, 14th and uh, Union Square. Union Square. Uh, involved a, a tremendous installation of a speaker. Oh my gosh. That we were asked to turn down immediately. <laughs> and never turned down. They, they basically just pulled the plug on it. So it, that's why I don't remember it. Yeah. <laughs> it never happened. Any case, that, thank you so much for those years, Matt. It, and I hope that uh, you find me always uh, appreciative of the work that you've contributed. And we kind of grew up together. I came here in 96, and you were before that, but you really were just getting into the seat as the uh, system designer here at the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies at that time. We sat down many a day in that room down below, and figured out strategies for max <laughs> patches that still exist and, and are still used. So that's kind of an amazing thing, really, because the technology still works. It, and it took a little effort, but these things still function, mostly. Uh, Matt Wright describes himself in this way. He says, I'm a composer, I'm a computer music researcher, improvising composer performer, musical ensemble leader, media systems designer, and since 2015, the technical director of Karma at Stanford. So the my and the eyes, that's him speaking. <laughs> my research interests include interactive systems, musical rhythm, new interfaces for musical expression, sound synthesis, sonification, and visualization, interactive audiovisual systems design, musical networking, sound in space, and computational ethnomusicology, which is huge these days, by the way. I started my career as the music systems designer at UC Berkeley's Center for New Music and Audio Technologies from 1993 to 2008, where I was known for developing and promoting the sound description interchange format, SDIF, and open sound control standards as well as work with real-time mapping of musical gesture to sound synthesis. I received my PhD from Karma's Computer-Based Music Theory and Acoustics program in March 2008, and my dissertation research involved perceptual attack time, the time that a sound is perceived as a rhythmic event, which in general is not the same as the sound's onset. We know that now, thanks. After my PhD, I then spent one year as a visiting research fellow at the University of Victoria on the theme of computational ethnomusicology. From 2009 to 2015, I was the research director at UC Santa Barbara's Center for Research in Electronic Art and Technology as, per, as principal development engineer for the Allosphere. Has, has anybody ever been to the Allosphere? Uh, still going. 
I spoke to, <laughs> to uh, Kachera, you know, she's up there turning it, she, turning it on. A three-story full surround immersive audiovisual instrument for scientific and artistic research. I'm going to close it up. As a musician, I play a variety of traditional club <coughs> flutes, Afro-Brazilian percussion, and computer-based instruments of my own design in both traditional music context and experimental new works. At UCSB, I founded and directed the Afro-Brazilian Ensemble and the Create Ensemble. I have a continuous online course, Programming Max. Is that still yeah. going? Well done. I okay, it's, to be alive it's, a, it's a small <laughs> set of things that Matthew Wright does. <laughs> Structuring interactive software for digital arts, teaching interactive audiovisual programming in Max MSP and Jitter uh, via Cadenza. So, Matthew Wright, great to have you. Thank you so Thank much. You. So, yeah, very kind and generous introduction. I will be. I'll be focusing on the uh, computer-based musical instruments and on the uh, experimental new works uh, to the like last uh, sentence of what Ed just read. Um, so basically, I'm going to give you just like a show and tell of all my stuff for the concert. Um, I'll start with a story. Um, David Wessel, in the, he told me this story in the 90s. I think it happened in the late 80s. He had traveled to New York to some prestigious venue and had like horrible problem with his luggage and his equipment had gotten knocked around and things had gotten unplugged and it had come apart and he didn't even sure it worked and he got to the place like just in time for the pre-concert talk and so he's like plugging the sample cell cards back into his PCI slots and putting it together and so he just kind of goes through feature by feature of his entire concert setup and afterwards one of a composer or colleague of his says you should never do that you should never show people you know, how the sausage is made. You should just talk about the abstract ideas of your art. And, and you know, this person didn't know that, like, David had to make sure that it all worked to even be able to do the concert. That's the punchline of the story. But um, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to, like, tip my hand anyway. So I conceive of myself both as, like, an artist, musician, composer, improviser. Uh, I know a person who would just, like, come and do a concert and you'd be like, oh, wow, cool, cool music. Thanks for the concert. But also I conceive of myself as an educator, you know, not only do I have this recorded class where you can learn Max, you know, just like the nuts and bolts of programming Max, which I, I assume that many of you, raise your hand if you've ever used Max Patch before. Mm -hmm. Like the majority, almost everyone in the room. Okay, so most of what I'm going to show is the actual patches and how all this stuff is connected to them. But uh, to set this frame, I'm going to go back to some, as you can see, very, very old... <laughs> PowerPoint slides. Like that t-shirt she like this is, oh, yeah, yeah. is the original Sinmat yeah. t-shirt. This, <laughs> oh, this is the first one that had the URL. Okay, this was, I actually have like a pre-URL Sinmat t-shirt that's got even more holes in it. Um, so yeah, um, so this is going back. So these are, the, I wrote these in the early 2000s. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna just kind of like put them out there uh, as just like a frame for, hello, a uh, frame for evaluating uh, digital musical instruments. So uh, these are just the names of all the things, but I have a slide for each one. So uh, this is one of the ideas that got one, some of the most traction from David Wessels in my uh, nine paper from 2001, the low floor, high ceiling. Or we put it uh, like initial ease of use coupled with a potential to develop long-term virtuosity. Something like that. So uh, on the left, an example of a low floor, low ceiling instrument that anybody can immediately get a you know, somewhat satisfying result just you know, with whatever their abilities are. Um, on the right, a high floor, low high ceiling instrument that uh, at first is going to sound horrible unless you know, a miracle occurs. But it rewards decades of, of practice. So this question of, you know, it's very easy to just like, here's a... Here's a, oh no, it stopped, why? Oh, oh no! Here's a, <laughs> it stopped working. Oh, it uh, lost USB, okay, well see, I should sh I should test every single feature before the concert tonight. <laughs> oh, interesting, I just had to turn this up. So, this is literally just triggering a sample every time I push a button. So that's a low floor instrument, right? Anybody, even my, my infant son at the time was like having fun just bashing on the thing and having the samples come out. 
Um, but can you make that a high ceiling instrument? Is there a way that like after practicing this for 30 years, I would just be so amazing at pressing those buttons and triggering those samples that you would want to come hear me do a concert of that? I think for this instrument, probably not. Oops, this is my, uh, this is my other sustain pedal, which is actually just a USB space bar foot pedal. Really good for unmuting yourself during a Zoom call. Um, but uh, I wanted to use it with this keyboard that didn't have a sustain pedal, so I have like a you know max sustain object. But I'm going to use it now also to advance through my slides here. Um, uh, so that's low floor, low ceiling. So latency and jitter. So this is a very technical issue um, that uh, basically it reduces the ceiling. The more lack of control you have over the rhythm. If I if I hit this thing. And yeah, maybe immediately, maybe in 10 seconds, maybe in 20 seconds, maybe in 30 seconds, that sound will happen. There's no way I'll ever get really good at playing it rhythmically because there's just sort of like a system unknown randomness that gets added to it just from bad engineering. So you always want to like as, a, as an engineer designing the system, you want to be designing, a, you want to be engineering away as much of the jitter as possible and just have really you know, precise, just consistent timing that like, I do the thing, the message gets to my software, the sound comes out, it's always reliable. Um, now here I've got like six USB controllers all going through USB A into this like USB hub, going through a dongle into my laptop while I've got like my web browser open and everything. So um, did I really engineer the jitter down to the absolute minimum right now? No. So again, I'm like, I'm telling you my aspirations um, but also that, uh, in a way, I'm not living up to it. So yeah, here's different different engineering sources of latency and jitter in like this kind of a system. Uh, so and then here's one of my favorite diagrams that I made in my dissertation: the loop of learning to be a musician. So you try to play one note, you have an idea in your mind, intention of a sound that you want. Uh, your brain turns that into like nerve impulses that travel electrochemically down your arm to cause your muscles to contract to whatever to make the thing happen. Uh, the instrument produces a sound, it comes back to your ear, you perceive it, and then this equal question mark is uh, like some part of your brain asking, is that what I was trying to do? Is that the sound I wanted to make? Is that the pitch that I wanted? Et cetera, et cetera. And if you repeat this, you know, hundreds of thousands of times, that's how you become a musician. And in particular, the latency of the instrument is part of this loop. So there's plenty of latency in the like, nerve impulses from your brain contracting your muscles to get the thing to happen and your brain just anticipates that. You know, if you're trying to spear the fish, you've learned over a lifetime how much before the moment that you want the spear to be right there, you have to start engaging those muscles. So if you are a, a church organist or an alpenhorn player, your instrument has a lot of latency, but it's a fixed latency. You know it's always gonna be the same amount. You just learn to adjust. You just anticipate you play that much in advance interesting about you know playing online and like jack trip and latency you could you could talk about that whole thing of like how do you do a distributed musical performance and how do you learn to anticipate that kind of latency but my point of all this is just that actually uh, latency is not that bad if it's consistent it's really the jitter that reduces the ceiling on that instrument that just guarantees you'll never get you'll never be able to control the timing of what comes out Okay, next to desiderata, I think that one would desire accuracy. So uh, here's like a whole bunch of USB MIDI controllers, but here's my example of a really accurate sensor, this nice uh, 2002 uh, Wacom and 202 tablet. Um, and this is a very good sensor because it has um, uh, about, a hundred, about a thousand points per inch of position sensing. So this is, this is zero. This is whatever, 32,000 or some hugely high number. And so, very small motion, you know, less than 1 one twenty eighth of the width of this thing is giving me a difference. And so what is this doing? I'll tell you in a little bit later. But point is this particular Wacom tablet is a very accurate sensor. Um, precision and reproducibility, again, this is like an engineering concern of the design of the instrument. Um, precision is when the sensor gives you the same values. So, like the pressure sensor in this thing, um, you know, if I put a certain like feeling of like, oh, that's like a mezzo piano, do I always get like a certain MIDI value around that range, or uh, is it kind of all over the place? Um, and then the reproducibility is the consistency of the entire instrument, top to bottom. Uh, reliability, of course, we want the things to keep working and not. Uh, 
uh, not crash and break. Uh, parsimony. So here's a real philosophical one, um, which again, uh, you could question whether I'm living up to my own ideal here, um, is uh, the simplest interface that can do the job. Is there, you know, do I really need all of these different gadgets on the stage here? Um, I'd like to think that if I didn't, I would somehow pare things down and just like boil down to the heart of, of the instrument design and just make the instrument have exactly the features that you need to get the results that you want and not like so such a complicated thing. And I guess I'll tell the counter argument of this. My very first time ever performing computer music, I was literally right here. I was stage left. Uh, it was with a uh, classical Indo-Pakistani vocalist and David Wessel, and I was just the drone player. I was just doing the in the background, the tambura uh, for this uh, like khyal vocal recital. And so I had like this metaphor that I was going to pluck the strings. So the, the way you really play the instrument is there's just four strings. Left hand doesn't do anything. You just open string, just go pluck, 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 pause. Like, right, and then they're just tuned to like five one 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 or something. Um, so you're just making a drum. That's the whole thing. You don't pay attention to the person. They're just sitting there to a company. It's not a. It's not a virtuoso role. It's not a. It's like a, the honor. Like the honor is like the student gets to accompany the master to to play the tambura. So here I am, the student accompanying the masters playing the tambura. But the instrument that I've made, I just have like a little bit of timbral control. So I have like a virtual pluck. I've got four strings. And I have a multi-slider object in Max, and uh, I'm just like putting the mouse down and moving it a little bit and letting go. And when I let go, it plucks the sound. And if I move it more and let go, it plucks a bigger sound. And if I move it less and let go, it plucks a smaller sound. But I was just like really getting into it. And I was just like, I was doing so much stuff. And at the end of the concert, David Russell is just like, uh... <laughs> He's so nice about it, but just this idea that there was a lack of correspondence, that I was making, my gestures were big, but the like musical reason for them, the resulting sound of it, was actually really small and not a big part of it. And did I have to have such a like overly theatrical stage performance for what was actually coming out? So it's the same question you could ask about, um, you know, you could talk about like the economy of motion of like, oh, I want to be a like fastest possible guitar player. I'm going to learn to like lift my finger the least possible amount off the string so I can put it back down fast and just have the most efficient technique and the best economy of motion and just be like the fastest shredder. But there's also Pete Townsend, who has a different style that's not economy of motion, that has other virtues besides this kind of parsimony. So again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm uh, stating my past values and then calling them into question here. Uh, transparency. Another huge question for electronic performance. Um, is that person reading their email or actually making the music with that computer? I can't tell, they're just sitting there staring at the screen. Um, so that's lack of transparency. So people usually, when you have this kind of stuff, you're like, you're sitting there in the audience going, oh, I wonder what that fader does. Oh, he started to press this thing. What change did that make in the sound? What does that thing do? So I'm, I'm hopefully gonna satisfy your curiosity, maybe um, extinguish, if not satisfy your curiosity with all this stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I, you know, and with an acoustic instrument, it's like, you know, anybody who's ever tried to play a keyboard can watch somebody play a keyboard and understand the skill that they're displaying. But um, when I play these keyboards, um, you're not going to be impressed by my keyboard skill. Um, so what are you going to what are you going to understand of what my performance is? So um, part of me wants to put, and I actually did some of this at our last performance, just actually put what I'm looking at on the screen for you to look at. And you can see that like when I press this keyboard, oh, that must be that part of the patch. And so maybe actually, I'm curious, maybe if I play this instrument for a moment, you guys could take a guess as to how it works. So that's the last of my desiderata. So I will, in the sake of transparency, I'll explain, like maybe I'll just work my way from left to right across here. So this is, so I've always been interested in looping with sort of a love-hate relationship, that it's such an effective way to uh, like, gen, like draw out musical material, um, but uh, the exact repetition just get, is 
so apparent. Uh, and I really don't like the just like exact, the same thing happening over and over and over again, audio wise. So this is one of my many kind of like uh, questionable versions of looping. So what I have here, this is a phrase uh, from a piece of John's called Doom Indigo, like mood indigo, mm -hmm. but doom. Um, and the very intro from the recording sounds like this. Except I'm in the wrong transposition. It is at this beat. So here's the beginning. beginning of the recording. In fact, I think I might even have, if you guys are composers, I could show you uh, somewhere. Oh, the great imports. <laughs> What's that? Great imports. I love that. Oh, yeah. That, I, that is such a good product. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you all about it in a second. Uh, Doom Indigo. Come on. Where's my PDF file? Just so you can see. Yeah, look. It's real music composed by John Schott. Um, so, but I'm not using this. I'm using the audio file and I put it through an onset detector that found all the moments, you know, at a certain, certain number of milliseconds, there was a little tss sound. And I segmented this sound recording into a Doom instance. So these are just the instance that are the beginnings of each little segment. There's, there's software like, um, there's a lot of DAWs now that will divide something up hit by hit and give you just like individual things to move around. So uh, that's not what this is doing. These are just potential loop begin and end points. So the idea is the smallest, most beginning loop is from time zero to time 390 milliseconds. And that's, excuse me, that's what this low C does, not that keyboard. Uh, this keyboard over here. So if I just am on low C, this is the kind of looping I don't like that, that, that the, the exactness of it starts to bother you, right? But just for, to make my point here, I'm starting at zero and I'm ending at 390. If I put the C sharp down, I get the first two segments. If I put the D down, Right, so that's the third segment. That's the third and fourth segments. Hmm. There's just the fourth segment. So I like, one of the things I really like about Stravinsky's music is the way that it's like, there's a repeating thing, but then there's an extra eighth note and then it repeats and it just kind of like, it sets up an expectation and then it like puts a little like extra step in it and then does that. So, um, so that's what this instrument is all about. So. Uh, it's just like a different kind of looping controlled by a keyboard where uh, all these different things. And then what I have, I don't know if you can see, those of you on the live stream, but I've actually notated like key by key, like the, the little dot just means a hi-hat hit and the X means a snare drum hit. And then I've got like one, four, five, one, as if this were a, like a straightforward total chord progression. Um, and I got a little square wave that shows the, the bass clarinet heavy. Uh, no, so it's just like my, uh, you know, memory aid of just like what exactly each one of these segments from that sound sounds like. And of course, the idea would be that somebody else would put in a different uh, particular recording, divide it up, find different time instants, but that this, um, this notion of controlling the loops and just like changing the loops uh, from a keyboard might be something that, uh, that uh, would be you know, a generalizable technique that somebody would be interested in doing outside of this one particular recording. Uh, let me pause for a second. How, uh, yeah, question? Um, how, how important it is, uh, the percentage that the person understands, if you are if you have like a camera over what you're doing and it's accessible, I mean, if they, if they understand it like 5%, that might be frustrating. And, Twenty-five percent, they might feel good. Eighty percent would be overkill. Whatever. I mean, that's mine. What do you yeah. think yours? I don't know. I think people I are so different. I mean, I think I think I'm a little bit of an outlier in my drive to try to figure out like yeah. the technology of what the person's doing. I think 
a lot of people find it easier than me to just kind of like put that curiosity aside and kind of yeah. just like sink into the music. But yeah, I don't have like a target amount of understanding that I'm, that I'm trying to give people. I feel like it's more like I'm offering Something. like what I'm offering and different people are looking for different things and different people are able to get different stuff out of it. Um, yeah. So this is so this is this is related to another idea called shifty looping. That is again uh, that I'm not going to use tonight or show in detail, but um, it's again it's it's an idea of multiple possible loops within a larger thing, and you're 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 just you're, you're replaying the same material, but you're not exactly just going over the same path over and over again. Sometimes you use these loop points, sometimes you use these points, and you shift around what the loop points are, but without having any discontinuity in the sound. So if you look here at the error message. Uh, so, like, if I'm in this, so you can see where the loop points are, but you can also see where the cursor is. So, um, if I suddenly say, uh, no, be here now, it actually couldn't because, because uh, it wasn't, the, the new loop points still have to span the current playback position. So... Uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of actually tricky stuff in here to make it just always be smooth um, that I won't get into in detail, but I would be happy to share the patch or uh, you know if there's questions to talk about you know specifically the case analysis. But it's like oh well the new loop points are after the current playback position, so I have to keep going in the current loop until I get to the point where the old loop and the new point overlap, and then I can switch to the new loop points or the new loop is before the current playback position, so I have to get to the end of the current loop and loop back one more time, and then I can switch. So it's a lot of that kind of logic. And it, it, doesn't, it isn't perfectly right. So it actually, if I, do, if I ask it for something that's not reasonable, it gives me an error message here that I'm also, in the sake of transparency, putting up on the screen for you guys to look at. Uh, the error went away. But um, it said something like, uh, already changing, so ignore. It's like in the middle. It's, it's actually, it's not a good implementation. If it's in, so if it's in this, if it's in this state where it has old loop points, it wants to go to the new loop points, but it has to wait until it like basically finishes the current loop or gets to the right point in the current loop. If, if and it's like, okay, I'm gonna switch loop points as soon as I get there, and then you switch them again while it's in the middle of that, it's not robust to like multiple overlapping requests. And what it should do is just, always just try to do the most recent request, but instead it has this like, oh, I'm not listening, I'm in the I have to stop and wait two more seconds until I'm ready for the next one, and then that causes these other problems if I have this kind of peripatetic performance style. So uh, that was, that's something, so I kind of, part of me wants to like really debug that and get it all like rock solid and then feel like I should offer it to the world somehow. That's a big kind of question underlying all of this, is like, how am I gonna share this stuff with the world? Uh, should I make a max package? Should I make like more online lectures where I explain how they all work? Uh, you know, I'm, I wonder what uh, you know means of sharing this would be valuable to people and worth the effort. Um, so that's not that's doom grooves. Um, uh, this keyboard and then the other stuff with these faders are just like a ma uh, an overall volume. Uh, main gain, we're not allowed to say master volume anymore because of the unfortunate history of systemic racism in the US, seriously. So I find myself, uh, you know, just doing that work uh, over and over again, being tempted to, not to call it a different kind of volume. Um, this is just forwards or backwards. So there's a speed right here that I control with two faders. I've got the how fast fader and uh, the astute. I will see that this is another instance of one four five one, uh -huh. right? Half is an octave down, two thirds is a fifth down, three quarters is a fourth down, one is normal, fourth up, fifth up, octave up. So I can play it. Uh, I can transpose it with this one four five. And so this is like one of Scott John's and my in jokes. It's like, oh, let's just have some. Let's have more one four five one in our music. It's this kind of abstract. Atonal stuff, but there's there's all these different things, and then forwards and backwards. So that's fun for like. Right, just going back and forth in time, forwards and backwards, sample playback. There's nothing too, uh, nothing too exciting there. So there's there's one instrument down. 
One, two, three, four, five, six to go. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going here, but I'm happy to happy to take questions, etc. Uh, yeah. Have you generalized the Doom groups to lay up for other types of samples, or uh, right now it's all thought of and learned with that in mind? I mean, I as a performer, you know, for tonight, I'm, uh, um, you know, I have this somewhat learned. Um, but the idea is that, that there's nothing about the technique that relies on that sample. So the idea yeah. would be that you would put in your own sample that could be chopped into hits and you could loop sure. it with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, obviously these exact scribbles on the tape on the keys here are specific to that. Um, but, uh, but there's nothing about the algorithm that's relying on any right. you know, musical properties of that excerpt or anything. Uh, okay. So here's an, uh, here's my, I'll do my other keyboard one. So um, this one is called single octave per pitch class. And it's another one, four, five, one joke. Um, so uh, this is what we, uh, so if I draw your attention to this part of the screen. Um, so the idea, it's kind of like in jazz. It's like the chord is, the chord is there even if no one's playing it. Um, uh, so the chord, the current chord is one, or with this fader I can bring it to four, or to five. Uh, so it's kind of like a somewhat E minor esque thing, and it has most pitch classes in it. So the idea is that I'm going to play. Oh, it's not catching it. Uh, why did you stop? Plug and replug. There it is. By the way, um, as a person who uses way too many MIDI interfaces and doesn't always have them all plugged in, I just discovered the best feature, the match port attribute. So it's always, it's been the case for decades that Max's objects were taking in MIDI input and sharing it with your patch node in, control in. You can tell it. If you have a bunch of devices plugged in and you double click on it, it'll show you all the names of all the devices you have plugged in. And you can say, as an argument, oh, I want to just get notes from the keyboard. But if you don't have your keyboard plugged in right now, then you get all MIDI notes from all devices at that particular object, unless you use the amazing match port attribute, which means if there isn't a keyboard right now, then don't give me any notes. Don't just give me the notes from the other device that I do have plugged in, which is the default. So it defaults to all devices if it doesn't match the, the name that you give it. But this match port uh, saves the day. So I was having so much frustration there. I would, hit a, I would hit a key and like this would start happening and this sample would trigger and uh, it was madness. Um, so I found match port. Yay. OK, so, uh, so single, single octave per pitch pass. So the idea is that no matter what C I press, doesn't matter which octave. I'm only I'm just turning pitch classes on and off, and I'm going to use I'm going to uh, give away my control of which octave the note will sound, or in fact whether the note will even sound at all. This chord doesn't have a B flat, so when I hit B flat, what comes out is the lack of B flat of this chord. But if I hit a B natural. What comes out is the low B natural of this chord. And if I go to this chord that has a B an octave up, what comes out is the B an octave up. Both of these have the same B. So the B doesn't change when I go between these two chords. So the idea is that if I mash every key, which is part of what this sustain class was so useful for. Right, so now, so now you're actually hearing our chords. Here's four, and here's five, and here's one. But that's not how I play it. The way I play it is I just like grab, grab the notes. You know, I'm just playing in one octave. Doesn't matter what octave I play. Uh, so that's the idea of single octave for pitch class. And then um, what I have going on is a thing that I call throb. So this. This is a D, it has a certain frequency, and some number of octaves below wah, wah, that note, like 
five, six, seven, some number of octaves, there's a, there's a number box somewhere that gives you this number, is the amplitude envelope. That's half cycle of a sine wave and then silence. So it fades in and fades out, and then it's silent, and then it fades in and fades out. And the best thing ever is changing that number of octaves. So that's, now it's the throbbing is going twice as fast, twice as fast again. Until when it's only like one octave, you start to get these timbral effects. <coughs> Just from, you know, now this amplitude envelope is actually going faster than the, than the period of the, of the synthesized thing. So when it's slow enough, you actually get, so if I'm doing like, here's my E and B. A little faster. So you're getting that like two against three. Unfortunately, this is equal tempered, so it's not, a, it's not an exact two against three, but it's the equal tempered approximation of that. So the, the rhythmic, I, I'm not the first person to like want to transpose pitch relations down to rhythm relations, understandable. But having it on a fader like this and have holding this chord, I'm quite fond of the kind of sound I can make with this. Um, another thing I do is I put each note in its own speaker. So that's sort of the the key to my. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of a ridiculous way to do it. I mean, there's smarter ways to do this procedurally, but I just have 24 instances of the throb object, which is one version of that. I'm actually using the old, the like MIDI poly object to turn my, uh, you know, it's doing voice assignment, but I've just manually routed each one of these poly polyphonic voices to a specific loudspeaker. Um, so that like the first note, uh, is coming out speaker one, and the second note is coming out speaker two, and the third note is coming out speaker three, and it just kind of naturally, like the bigger the chord is, the more enveloping it is. Um, so that's poly, poly throb, right? The throb thing that has this amplitude coming in and out um, polyphonically. And then uh, the other thing that I do a lot is I make these presentation modes. So when I've got like way too many features, um, I, uh, I like boil it down to just what I want to look at, and then I use a technique called front me that I'll show you. Uh, the object this patcher, you can send it some messages that cause uh, that window to come to the front. So what I do is um, I make it be that when that MIDI note comes in, the, the, both of these windows come to the front, right? So here's another max window that's in front of those, and it will stay in front of those while I touch all these other things. Now I brought this window to the front because I'm pressing this one. Now I brought this window to the front because I'm pressing this one. Now I brought that one to the front because I'm pressing that one. So uh, it can be annoying during development. Like you press, you're, you're debugging in some other sub patch, and you, every time you hit a key, the other thing comes in. Um, but just in terms of keeping it all straight on uh, limited screen space and just having the thing that you need to look always be there, um, just tying it to, to that. And then also, I would like to think that it's, that it's also part of transparency, that like when I, you know, when I, when I start moving this fader, at least that window comes to the front, so you get like the slightest clue of what, what I'm controlling, just like on a per window basis here. Uh, okay, so speaking of... Uh, speaking of putting sounds in individual loudspeakers, here's another version of that. So um, these samples also, um, each one comes in the next speaker. So it's, uh, let's find another one. So these chords. So you can see, well, where's the, where's the really long? I can't even hit that key fast enough to like use up all eight voices of polyphony, but with these really long ones, these go forever. So I, I, I really like the like envelopment of this particular sound. And I thought I had a yeah, quick way to turn it off. So this is uh, Ed. 
probably remembers there's a whole family of uh, Sam still available and working. Still available and working. So here's a new one. Uh, that, so these are sample playback uh, patches that are made to be used inside Poly. They use the dot .voi for like one voice inside your Poly object, but this goes way back. Um, T means able to be transposed. NL means no, no looping. Um, and then this my speaker tab uh, tag in the name means that um, right here, this poly tells you which particular voice this one is. And I've got an argument. Oh, I should change this because I'm in a I'm not in a 24 channel sound system anymore. So I'm only in a 16 channel sound system. So voice 17 should go back to talking to output one, voice 18 should go to two, whatever. So I have an argument that's the true number of speakers. And then here, if I make it a smaller number, it'll be more obvious. If I make this number four, then the first one comes out speaker one, second one comes out speaker two, speaker number four, three, number four, and then back to one, two, three, four. Again, the way this works coding wise is I take the number from this poly, I modulo it by that <coughs> number I do, a minus one plus one, because it's being zero origin or one origin. And then um, and then this gate means that this can only happen one time. Because after it happens, the gate closes itself. And I'm just using this set message to DAC tilde. And I'm Whatever sound I'm making, I'm sending it to a DAC that's been set. So I'm going straight. That's one disadvantage of this technique is there's no like uh, separate gain stage after this patch. It's going right to the DAC. Um, and then I also send them all out the left outlet uh, of the pot. I send it also to out tilde one so that it'll be mixed just so that I can have um, this kind of a thing. Uh, like see, you see, I'm not using this signal output of the poly. I'm not sending to a sound, but I am at least seeing in one scope object the mix of all these samples that I'm making. So <coughs> that mix output, I don't, I don't, I only use for visualization. But again, just like each triggered sample just goes in its speaker. So I'm not, I'm not a, not a big panner. I'm a fan of what uh, the sound spatialization technique that Curtis Rhodes refers to as put a speaker there. <laughs> um, it's tr truly the best in many respects. I, I actually heard several speakers going when you were going to, are they hooked up the way they're going to be hooked up? Yeah, well, I mean, the first sample goes out one speaker, and then the next sample oh. goes out the next speaker. So while, while oh. this note is going, that playback voice is full. I think it's, it should be, it shouldn't only be that one. Okay. Um, you know, acuity of sound localization is a question. I'm sorry, what? No, no. and low frequency of time. Yeah. The, um, the best sound for that is jingling car keys. Oh, yeah. If you have keys, uh, mm -hmm. go like this. Oh. Um. I have really good ones. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So. Oh, but I can never find them. That's oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Just shake your bag and you'll hear that sound. Uh. Very nice. Um, so again, this idea, and then the other, the other thing on sample playback um, is uh, having a bank of samples. What did, I, what did I promise? New, two beloved <coughs> tricks to enhance simple one-shot sample playback. So one of them is uh, just put each voice in its own speaker, and the other is when I want a sound, uh, this one is called short res. This is on uh, John's resume. These are all uh, recordings that John made in his home studio that I'm, that I'm triggering here. So part of, part of the point of, of all these instruments is that they're all like connected to John in some way, whether they're just literally samples of him or his compositions or uh, it, it, like the sound world is, is almost entirely, other than the synthesized part here that I was talking about, which is so quiet. Because of that cane bone. Um, that's the, actually the only fully synthesized part of it. Everything else is somehow derived from what he's saying. But my point was that I have a little collection. So 
This is just saying which pad corresponds to which category of sound file. But then I've got all of these other ones. So each one of those is actually a collection. So I actually have 10 sound files that are called Taylor Chord 1, Taylor Chord 2, Taylor Chord 3. So there's 10 of those. And if I find my Taylor Chord in here, that is, you'd think I should have memorized this. I should put like a little tiny piece of tape on every one of these pads that like visually reminds me what that one is. Four chords. That. So there's one of them. Specifically, that one was number nine. It randomly chose number nine. But if I do it again, it's number one. That time it was one again. And again, like your ear caught the exact repetition of the same sample. So that's the other trick, is just have, don't just trigger the same sample, have a bunch of equivalent samples. Like, uh, practice was all about this. You had an incredible organization of triangle samples, and like 10 or 20 or more of each type. It was extreme. It was very extreme. <laughs> so, um, there are over 2,000 samples. Yeah, over 2,000 samples, <laughs> just from triangles, right? You think the guitar has a, a broad sound world, try the triangle. Um, uh, but yeah. Uh, Training, da training data, right? There. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it just like it just really it gives you it gives you the same like uh, you know musical power of being able to like trigger them fast or whatever. Um, but uh, it saves you from this like oh yeah you're just triggering the same sample again. Um, so yeah, those are my two beloved tricks of uh, 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 buckets of the same kind of sample that you pick from randomly and then the, the spatialization thing. Okay. So, uh, three down. Um, so let me show you the old laptop. So this, <clears throat> this laptop, which you're not looking at on the screen, it's running uh, OS X 10.7, because that's the last operating system version that the Max external that reads data from the Wacom tablet uses. Oh, I did want to show. Here we go. Oh, this is actually this is actually exactly what I'm talking about. Sinusoidal models of musical phrases. So this is all this stuff came out of, of, of my work at Sidmat. Um, uh, so sinusoidal model is uh, you start with a sound recording and you model it with sinusoids. You ask the question, how would I change the frequencies and amplitudes of some number of sinusoids so that as they change over time, they're making an approximation to the sound I started with. So the Spear software uh, still works. It still makes STIF files out of sound files. That's what I would recommend. Uh, Earcom had a whole uh, whole tool chain for this as part of their analysis synthesis team. That's what we used to use back in the day. They have a Max Patch version of its release. Okay, and it, it and it does this. It makes an STIF file out of like whatever sound you put in. And there's a bunch of parameters that like really understanding what they do. You need like a PhD in signal processing, but um, <clears throat> with a little bit of tweaking and some luck, you can get reasonably usable results. Um, so then what you have is a thing that says, well, to, if, you, if you have these, say, 50 sine waves, and they all have these amplitudes and frequencies at this time, and then a few milliseconds later, they all have these amplitudes and frequencies, and a few milliseconds later, you've got all these envelopes for all these sine waves, and if you play them back, you get an approximation to where you started. But among the many things that you can do to modify this, you can resynthesize it. Um, what I'm using is the fact that you can index time any way that you want. So here's a little bit of math, just uh, for the sake of having a little math. One time I wanted to have more math in my PowerPoint slide, so I, I made this one. So if this means anything to you, that's great. You know what I'm talking about. If otherwise, I don't really want to explain all this. Um, but it's just it's this is just a, this is just an additive synthesizer. There's, we're just adding up a bunch of sine waves that have a certain phase at any moment and have a certain amplitude at any moment. And the phase at that moment comes from the history of what the frequency was. Um, the, the fre it's basically the integral of frequency and space. Um, so this is what I have written on my tablet. Again, this is a, like not a form of notation that is describing the musical materials that I've chosen to have access to in my software. So this is not like 
my goal in performance is to produce this music. It's that the material that I started with, I have notated for my own purposes so that I can do this process of scrubbing. So what I do is these are half inch tall uh, regions and they're just like totally different, separate recordings, different musical phrases. And they're all like 10 or so seconds long and I have time zero all the way on the left and the ending time, whatever it is, you know, if it's a 10 second thing, this is the 10 second mark. And as I move continuously through here, I'm looking up time from the original record. So here- but it's a model, they're all models. They're all models. Yes. So I'm not, I'm not, I mean, you could do this with a granular type technique and you could say, well, I'll choose grains from around this point in the sound file and I'll just like keep triggering them through some so how instances. many frames are in a second? Of a uh, well, <laughs> depend. That's that's one of the many settings that you have to choose when you're like banging your head against the software. But it's typically on the order of like uh, every few milliseconds is the next frame. So a, a frame of additive synthesis is maybe let's say three milliseconds mm -hmm. long. It depends on the FFT size and the hop size and blah 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 blah. There's a lot of a lot of DSP math. Uh, to really answer that question, but you know, for our purposes, a, a few milliseconds, let's say. So is this descriptive or proscriptive? This is descriptive. So I already chose these musical phrases. These particular ones are from a saxophone. Um, and you can see it's just my own personal notation. So this is just like an actual, this is just saying there's a lot of vibrato here. This is a decrescendo. This is a rest, which means that there's still some sound in there, but it's just like, like weird little quiet sine waves that are like, trying to model the noise. These are just like D4, E flat 4. So these are just like pitch names with octaves. Um, these kind of like crosshatch things are where the analysis really did a bad job and it doesn't sound like the thing at all. It just sounds like weird sine waves just kind of going crazy all through the spectrum. Um, which is, and these are all like different places that are, like have different uh, value of dipping into. So it's not, it's not necessarily telling you to avoid that point. It's just warning me that that's what I'm going to get at that but, point. So this is your ear describing what the analysis did of a certain text. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say text, but well, no. but yeah, a musical uh, phrase. Musical phrase. Okay. Ah. And where's the musical phrase? That's your invention. Or? Uh, well, I mean, the musical phrase. So unfortunately, uh, you know, people. Have been, I've been like describing this technique for 20 years, and like right from the very first time, people say, "Well, why can't why can't you do the analysis in real time?" Why does it have to be with pre-recorded phrase? And still, the answer is because it takes a lot of tweaking. You don't always just get a perfect STIP file off the bat, yeah. and you just have to. Um, a little comedy show here as I try to reassemble the side button on my Wacom pen for the like fifty thousandth time. Um, uh, so, so let me show you. So here, uh, here's a good one. So this is a this is a, a tune by John called Droll and Morose. And I'll try to play it. Mm, da, 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 da. Vibrato. So the thing about this is like you can really mess up the vibrato. If you go too slow, there's none. If you go too fast, it sounds really unnatural. If you go too slow, uh, but the way he played it, it was just a, da, 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 da. you know, it sounded nice the way he did it. So that's one of the things about this method. You gotta you gotta be careful with vibrato. Da, 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 da. And then he repeats that. So I've got a little, I got the, uh, an F written right here, because nah, that note's an F. I wanted to know that that's there. And I just kind of have some squiggles for this trill. Da. And then, oh, what happens? Five, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and wait, what's, what comes next? Oh, that's right, it's four. So again, our 1451 uh, inside joke here. So, but I'm, I'm showing you the way this thing works. So if I just hold the pen, you just get one particular set of frequencies and amplitudes, the sine waves, and it just sustains forever. And that's sinusoid tilde. This is the sinusoid tilde object that's doing that. Um, so I can go backwards. Uh, And the other thing I did, and this was, um, this was really inspired by a thing that's stylistically very common on a uh, Middle Eastern lute that I play called the Oud, where very often you're playing a melody note, but then you throw in a note an octave down. Uh, 
you know, if like if, if a note has like two count duration, you could play like the octave down on the first count and then the regular octave on the second note. It's just stylistically part of playing the oud. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't I just do that same thing? I'll take whatever spectrum I'm currently sustaining, and all I do is I press this button, and it makes a resonators tilde model of it, where it sets the decay times just according to frequency in like the usual way, where low ones decay longer. Um, so it sounds like this. I feel like that's not loud enough. This is what I was worrying about before. I'm going to... Stand by. Do you think you can fix that? Yeah, okay. Alright, watch this. Okay, so Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna temporarily fix it by just turning down this amp. But that's the other thing. I put the scrubbing of the guitar in an actual guitar amp and it kinda takes the edge off in a nice way, gives it like a little bit of a nice tone. Give me a way to just like whatever I'm making, no matter how crazily in harmonic, whatever the whatever the spectrum is, you just multiply each frequency by one half and make up a corresponding decay time, and then just boom, just ping that note right there. Um, so that's the basic idea of scrubbing. And then the two, the three knobs are just ma uh, main gain, um, and then transposition. But changing transposition on the knob, it has like a very um, R two or E two. Yeah, it's got a very like distinctive like electronic E sound. So I don't I, I I don't make too much of that transposition button. But what I do like is the stretch button. So here, let me find a nice. So there's a nice note. So stretch. Um, makes the partials be spaced more widely or less widely. So if it's a harmonic series, they should be 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz. So with the stretch at like 0 0.01, it would be 100 hertz, 202 hertz, 304 hertz, right? Uh, and you can compress too, so. So like now, almost all the overtones are just like right above the fundamental because it's it's at the minimum value, and then that's the like the regular original mainly harmonic series. So I really I really like the sound of like the guitar, but played back with the high partials too high. So it's like. It, So and to me, I find it very like, especially when you're when you're in this world of electronics and you have infinite possibilities of digital sound, and you're trying to work with a you know a, an acoustic musician or in John's case, electric. Um, you know, there's always a question of how do you make the sound world work well together? How do you like? I've heard people say marry the sound of the computer to the sound of you know the flute, the guitar, the cello, the vocalist, the whoever it is that you're working with. Um, so. Like I said, I like to use a lot of um, sound material that originally comes from John, but I also like to sort of be in this uh, kind of uh, indeterminate space where it's like a little bit computer electronic sounding, but also a little bit guitar sounding. And I, I like to kind of play with that ambiguity as to like, is it exactly the same sound as him? And you know, how far can I take it in the, in the computer? like going crazy direction. And and I don't want to always be going crazy. I want to be just, a lot of the times I want to be just like, just a slightly unreal version of what's happening. So the, the stretching I find really nice because it lets me kind of go like completely to crazy computer sounds very easily with these, you know, inharmonic spectra. But still it's like all of the material ultimately comes from the guitar. So there's still like phrasing built in. There's still like, I'm still getting some of the, the yeah. flavor of the guitar, even while I'm doing all this uh, modification. Please. Are you constrained to horizontal movements in this framework, or could you? Well, no. I mean, this thing just reports X, X, Y, and pressure. So you could make up anything you want. Um, 
what I found was that I wanted to have multiple phrases. So stacking them like this made sense. Um, and ergonomically speaking, it was just like more precise to go like this than to go like this. But no, I mean, you could do anything. And you know, as an artist, you know, if you just like naturally start making, you know, scribbling motions, like the geometry of your elbow and everything, it doesn't like lend itself to perfect. Um, one important trick for this is um, which phrase I get is determined only by the, the uh, which one I'm in at the time the pen goes down. So the pen goes down here, I'm on the third one down. I'm going back and forth. I'm not even looking down. I'm just going back and forth. I've left the third one down. I'm now on the fourth or the fifth one. But that's OK as long as I don't release and touch again. I stay in that one that I started on. So that's a really important. The otherwise, uh, the half inch is, is much too short. But the half inch is like just enough that for one thing I can like write enough a notation to be able to like give myself enough of a hint of what's there, and it's kind of in a sweet spot of like yeah I can reliably hit the third one even if this piece of paper shifts a tiny bit I can still like not get the wrong one. Yeah. Um, and then again this trick of like once I started in this one it doesn't matter I can even go out of that area and I'm still in that one. Um, so yeah, that's the Wacom tablet. Is, uh, that, is that an artifact of the tablet itself, or the, um, the, the uh, software once it goes from the USB into the computer? Is what an artifact? Uh, uh, the fact that you're staying in the channel when you put your mouth in your hand. No, that's my software. I, I oh, coded that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the all the the tablet, the tablet is just like X Y Z. Next X Y Z, next X Y Z. You know, like the SD files, like every few milliseconds, there's a new value. So everything else is, is my Mac. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, it was funny to read, like in your description, you said today, like you know, using this old 2010 MacBook with this OS and outdated stuff. Is there is there some kind of interest or appeal for you for using kind of outdated technologies in that way? Or uh, no, not at all. No, no, no. It's um, uh, I would get a more modern Wacom tablet. But, uh, and a more modern, I have a more modern laptop, but the, the Max external that reads the data from the Wacom tablet stopped being supported. So uh, this is just a laptop that I was able to freeze on 10.7. Um, yeah, we'd have to rebuild because even talking to the current Wacom, that would just be a, <coughs> we wouldn't be able to port it. We even tried that. Yeah, because yeah, there's like new drivers, because yeah. the, the object always like talks at a low level to the Wacom drivers, and you know, read some struct from memory that was where the current coordinates are kept. And right. it was always like a janky thing that was totally reliant on the Wacom drivers to work, and the Wacom changed their drivers. Um, you know, so I love doing this, but apparently not enough to like spend two weeks banging my head against this technical problem to get it working on my new laptop. Because why would I have to I have access to this awesome 2011 laptop? But no, I don't have any fetishization of of the old technology for this. I mean, it's fun to say, oh yeah, I'm performing on period instruments at Synmat. <laughs> um, but not because I actually want to be on 10.7. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question. So what I heard, what I experienced is that you demonstrated at the beginning that you were drawing on this history even by using an old PowerPoint, showing that these ideas, these memes that came out of Sinmat and David uh, are sort of like a bag of ideas that, that you have uh, digested and you, and you carry within this system. These are deep ideas and they don't, it's not just simply, oh, here I made this looping thing or here I made this, it's quite, different, it's something like composing instruments. And so could you say something about that part of the aspect of, like, you don't just say, oh, I'm gonna do this today, and then I'm gonna do that. No, something is going on in terms of a relationship yeah. between the, uh, let's say, the programming part and the music part. Yeah. And you've always been uh, a musician, and you've always been a performer. And you've always been like super good at technology. So somewhere in there, you belong to like that '90s view. You know, yeah. is that, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I, 
Yeah, I mean, and I call it the composing instrument. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, th I definitely think of this as composing instrument. I definitely, um, I definitely understand that the decisions I'm making as I'm building these instruments are a mix of compositional decisions and technical decisions. Um, I feel like you know the history that I'm drawing on is both like a a rich philosophical history of great ideas that have been you know tossed around by great minds over the years. Um, but also like very just mundane, like, well, I already have a patch that does that kind of sample synthesis playback. So uh, the, the, the past, like in a way, again, like the patch is this, the past is giving me this rich resource of just like finding patches on my laptop that do things that I want to do now musically. Um, but it's also constraining. You know, it's like, oh, well, I have this thing that kind of works, but I don't remember exactly how I did it, and it's got some bugs, and I don't have time to fix the bugs, and I'll just kind of work around it. So there's a, you know, there's, it's a mixed bag having all this history, because you've been, you're tied to it as well. So, you know, part of me, you know, but what part of me wishes that I'd, like, given up all this stuff and, like, switched to Super Collider five years ago and just, like, <laughs> redone everything and like it would have been better engineered and I w it would have been like understood from the uh, you know the modern the perspective of what I ended up able to do rather than the stuff that was written with the perspective of trying to figure out what I could do so you know there's always the sort of technical question of like when you throw things out when you make a new version when you clean things up when you just like make something messy for performance and call that good enough um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm dancing around your question. No, no, here. It's, it's, it's not a question, it's a conversation. But the yeah. thing is that you're not someone, as the technical director at Karma, you know what's going on. Yeah. So so the thing is, that, as, I, as I say, you're, you're, like when you pick <coughs> up your oud, for example, and you touch that, this influences the way you think. Big time. And this, this idea of sort of uh, the merger between mu music making, music physical instruments and this is something that belongs almost to you know it's like a a thing that is sort of passing in a way in my mind there you go. It, you, I mean I don't mean to be critical of it no it's true no I think you know it's funny at the time we were just like on the vanguard of like, <laughs> exactly. like you know we were the ones who were like solving the problems with digital musical instruments and we were going to usher a new era of creativity that was not bound by the limited mindset of the manufacturers of the and yeah, now here I am like full of MIDI faders and <laughs> like you, still you, talking still like uh, like uh, front and like I uh, you know I'm changing the world here but um, you yeah. use this important word several times you said sharing how will I yeah. share this yeah. well, and that's not just sharing the sound or your performance yeah. ability right that yeah. was part of it as well yeah. it yeah. was about how you how you communicate because you're not sharing a patch you're sharing a set of ideas, yeah. right? Well, I mean, well, I sometimes mean, I share patches. Waking me up there, uh, yeah. that's all I was saying. Yeah, yeah, no, sometimes I share patches, um, but, you know, none of this none of this just, like, makes sense as a patch. There isn't any, like, one patch. Like, wh even whether it's, like, this main patch that has all my other patches inside it. Uh, don't quit. Um, like, giving you this patch wouldn't empower you, right? So I uh, like as a person who wants to like I want to share something that's going to actually be a value to you that you're going to be able to use. Um, so I feel like all of this stuff. I mean, th I just have this kind of argument all the time. I, I'm I was on the other side of it. Um, Adrian Freed was was really big on not releasing the thing until he was satisfied with it, and he would do something really cool and everybody would want to use it, and he'd be like, "Sorry, you can't have that thing that I just showed you. That's really cool because." In some indeterminate amount of time, I will personally be satisfied, and then I will choose to release it to the world. So um, now I and I used to hate that and argue with him and you know beg and plead and control to, to you know get whatever that thing was that I wanted to like do the next step with. Um, but now I I feel I hear myself sounding like him saying, "Oh, well, I would like to share all this cool stuff that I'm showing you, but yeah, I should really clean it up a bit first. You don't want this version of it. Let me in some." indeterminate future amount of time like make it into the thing that I wish it were and then give you the thing that I want to be giving you rather than the thing that I actually have so uh, but, but, yeah I'm sorry I don't want to take up other people's questions I just have to, you just woke me up that's all okay 
But I'm just saying that, look, uh, we seem to be moving into a space in which you no longer see this. You, it's, a it's a black box space. Yeah. It's closed. You know, you, you have to get down to the circuit itself to figure out what, yeah. no one's sharing <laughs> that. And also, the, maybe there was some notion that in the kind of John Channing mythology, oh, maybe we'll come up with something that would, you know, scale up and generate some yeah. thing, right? But people aren't walking around so much with that, right? Uh, no, just, I don't think anybody... <laughs> I just want to confirm that. There's going to be another, <laughs> like, multi-million dollar sound synthesis patent coming out of... Uh, yeah, and the industry yeah. is ne not necessarily paying any attention. It doesn't really matter. So it really is art. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's funny uh, criteria, but I'll take it. Suffering. Yeah. Um, so uh, time has slipped away. It's almost 4.30. Um, the one thing that I haven't shown you is maybe the best idea of all is ensemble feedback networks. So. Um, the original conception of this was for a human ensemble of musicians. Um, the idea that, so like 99.99999% of musical ensembles, they work just by mixing the sound of the musicians. If there's two people, you hear his sound plus my sound. So the idea of the, of the networked ensemble is that each instrument has an input and an output. The output is both coming from like a loudspeaker next to that person, and potentially routable into the input of the other instruments. So I use, uh, yeah, once again, there it is. So here, so I, uh, this matrix control object is showing you that the output of instrument one is going into the instrument of instrument two, and the output of two is going into three, the output of three is going into four, and the output of four is going into one. So it just makes a loop. So if I play a sound, it uh, will tend, if the gains are high enough, will tend to just go around. So if I break all the connections, then eventually the sound dies down. But the sound comes out of the network itself. So it's a really fun way to play with other people. You you know you just like all you need is to take a little low pass filter and this like crazy huge soundscape comes through and you just like do your little shaping of it and you're adding to the sound but like your sound isn't just in your instrument. It's like everyone's sound is in your instrument. It's a really it's a fun way to play. Um, and then of course the the question is well do you need to have four people to have a four point feedback network? Why don't you just do all four nodes yourself? So that's what these four things are. These are the four voices of the feedback network. And if I, again, just put them into like a straight thing here, and I just trigger a sample into it, um, one sends it to two, two sends it to three, three sends it to four. It's just kind of going around the room. I should spatialize these better. These should, these should be like in, in proper quad. Um, but then you can change the frequency here. Let me get so like tonal stuff into the Oops. Keep audio running in Mac. How did that happen? Um, so this is the delay time. So each one of these instruments is like a one second delay. So if you change the delay time, then while the delay time is changing, the frequency changes. So I'm going to make the first one's delay time go down. And again, my 145 one thing, the rate was 1.33333, so I went up by fourth. Um, so um, for a brief duration of time, for a brief dur duration of time, the delay time was getting shorter, and so the, the pitch transposed up. So this is a formulation of a uh, time varying delay time where you are setting the time ratio at which you're reading back the sound that was recorded into the delay time. So if I read it back, here, I'll change this one to a low number. 
So it's transposing down, and the delay time is increasing. So much so, it was decreasing for so long that the went down another fourth, because that sound made it all the way through the network around again. So I can, so it's, uh, I'm, the delay time, right, so I'm reducing this time by transposing up during like a, a fixed duration. And then there's a bunch of other stuff. The other part that I have in here is a, an analysis synthesis using fiddle. So uh, this whole spectrum is being boiled down to a single, uh, single value. Oh, look, fiddle's not out for the end thing. Yeah, here we go. Fiddle is getting that note. There's like a few little glitches. So I can, I can, uh, I can choose to have each of these voices. circulating in the network, then it does more of this kind of stuff. So, um, and then all you have to do is break all the connections and it like gives this like nice kind of gradual fade out. So I love these C-Rock networks. I love like being in a musical ensemble um, where, you know, just like bring your, bring your flanger and that can be your instrument and we'll just plug in your input and your output or just the mixer, just the gain knob some crazy granular synthesizer, it kind of like levels the playing field in a way. And it gets you into this group mind where it's not just like, oh, I'm getting bored. I'm just going to like show my skills and, and do something on my own. It's just, it just becomes this like group sculpting of the sound experience. So um, yeah, Ensemble Feedback Network's my final idea for the day. So uh, yeah, one more question. Um. So it sounds like you're ch you're, when you change the delay time, you're also changing the time base of that particular channel. Well, so the way I think of it is, tap in is like, think of a tape delay. Yeah. Tap in is like the record head, yeah. and then there's some amount of tape, yeah, and like then here's the playback yeah, head. So, so, so while time. you're shortening the delay time, you're reading back oh, faster reading back. than the tape was recording. Oh, yeah. And as you're increasing the delay time, you're reading slower than the tape yeah. was recording. Unless you're decreasing it so fast that you're playing it back backwards faster than it was recorded. You can do that too, right? So basically, as you're changing the delay time and you can't be any less than the minimum, one, one signal buffer actually, um, and you've got some maximum, you know, 10 seconds or however long you allocate it as your delay memory, but within that limit, any change in the delay time will just transpose. Just in the most basic, just like play the sample faster, you know, the, 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 the most crude form of transposition that transposes the spectrum as well. I thank you all for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's concert. Thank you.